Funding for Current Conversations is provided by the University of Oklahoma President's Office, OU Outreach and World Literature Today. Welcome to Current Conversations. I'm R.C. Davis Sundiano. My guest today for this encore presentation is soils engineer, Dr. Amy Serrato. How does the soil react under the weight of an old building? When does the ground support guy wires and beams, and when does it fail? Dr. Amy Serrato has the answer to these questions. Join us for a look into the world of a geotechnical engineer next on Current Conversations. Amy Serrato, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. Maybe we could talk a little bit about geotechnical engineering. I have a feeling that that's not the most common label of anything an engineer does for many people. Uh, what is it? That's true. Well, geotechnical engineering is a subset of civil engineering, and we study and design with earth materials. So anything that you see that's built above the ground is built on soil or rock, we build with soil and rock, such as a dam or a levee, mm -hmm. and we build through soil and rock, such as a tunnel. Okay, this is pretty important stuff because everything, every, every building, every part of infrastructure rests on something, right? That's correct. So we call geotechnical engineering the foundation of civil engineering. Makes sense to me. Yeah. I've been picking up that there's a, a perspective that seems to go along with geotechnical engineer. It seems to have something to do with viewing soil as a construction material. Would that be accurate? That's right. Well, we, we build the infrastructure, which you can see on soil. We build with soil and we build through soil. So people view uh, the soil or the rock material as something, as a construction material, but it's a very complicated material. So we have to understand the physical properties. Does it shrink when we have a drought or does it swell when we have a lot of rain? We have to understand the chemical properties. Mm -hmm. How does it react with certain rainfall events? And when we build on that soil or with that soil or through that soil, and we put a specific load on it, how is it going to behave? And that is such an interesting perspective. It, just, it seems like you're talking about soil the way you would talk about any building material. It's going to have drainage ability, uh, load bearing uh, capacity. Um, what else? Compressibility. Sure, we have to worry about building settling. So we have to make sure that the soil is strong enough and compact enough that when you put a nice building like this on it, that it won't settle and crack and make the doors unusable or make the drainage lines, the sewage lines run the wrong way. Uh, so it's really important to make sure that your soil site, your, your preparation is correct for whatever load you decide to put on that. Okay, my guess is if somebody's kind of racking their brain to think about an example of an example that for, for what you're talking about. The most likely example might be the Leaning Tower of Pisa because everybody's seen the lean. Looks like they tried to correct it when it was half built. Would that be a good example of a soil problem? Sure, well, back in the 1100s when they were building the Leaning Tower of Pisa, it wasn't leaning to start with, <laughs> but they didn't have uh, the ability to drill into the soil to see what was underneath. And that's one of the most intriguing parts about geotechnical engineering is we can't see what's underground. So we have to do some drilling to find out what kind of soils are underneath. So with the Leaning Tower of Pisa, uh, they built half of it on a nice, hard, firm soil foundation what they, material. What they thought was nice and hard. Right. Yeah. And then the other half, they had some organic material, so it was soft. So the building settled differentially, and mm. uh, that's why it started to lean. This and has never been clear for me until this moment. So it's about 20 meters across, right. and you're saying fully half of that circle is on something solid, and the right. other half is on... An organic, really soft, compressible material. Think about a sponge, and if you put something heavy on a sponge, it's going to squeeze that water out, and that's what happens with an organic. It doesn't have really a lot of strength. And so it kept leaning and leaning, they kept building it, and they didn't know what was going on. And finally, it got to a point where it was very unsafe. So what they did was they excavated underneath the high side. That's pretty recent, right? And pre pretty recent, yeah. and they, they tried to pull it back into spec, but they still wanted it to be leaning because it's what draws people to Pisa. So, so if there had been an, a, a geotechnical engineer when that was built, probably he or she would have rejected that as a site. And, and would say, no, this is not going to work. It's too soft. It's hard over here. 
that's misleading us, we need another site. And that's, that would be the value of that kind of analysis. Sure, we could say you could have another site, but if the client really wanted to build there, we could say, okay, well, we're gonna have to spend a little bit more money to do a deep foundation. And we drill or we drive a pile down to a firm uh, material below that soft material. So the difference between what you do and say a geologist is, it, w would it be that you're more concerned with the surface soil, whereas a geologist is gonna look at rock and, and soil formations everywhere? In a broad sense, yes. Yeah. Uh, we always say to our civil engineering students that you need to take geology because if you understand geology, you understand how a soil is going to behave because mm -hmm. all of the soil weathers from those parent bedrock. So we need to know, is it a highly swelling clay or is it a sandy gravel? And if you know what the, the parent bedrock is, the geology of it, you'll have an understand more of an understanding of how that soil is going to behave when we build on it. But yes, geotechnical engineers are really interested in that more near surface soil profile. What is going to compress when you build on it? Uh, what is gonna swell underneath your foundation? The other example I think of is the, the break in the levee system in New sure. Orleans in 2005. Mm -hmm. Leaning Tower is kind of fun and it's a tourist attraction, but doesn't this example really bring home what happens when we didn't understand soil mechanics well enough with the levee system, right? Sure, well, there's a lot of issues that went into the levee breaches in New Orleans, but uh, one major one was when they were building the levees, they built some of the levees out of a sandy, silty gravel material that they dredged mm -hmm. from the bottom of the Mississippi. And that type of material is permeable and it lets water through. And when we build levees, we want to use a soil that is impermeable. Okay. And so we use the wrong type of material. The geotechnical engineers use the wrong type of material to hold back that water. And then we didn't understand the foundation material when we were putting in those T-walls, those concrete T-walls that mm -hmm. broke. And there was a lot of organics and peat. And so... Um, were there piles uh, or piers beneath those levees that were, where they were trying to hold up the reinforce the sides? There were, okay. they, they went back and retrofitted some some of the concrete and steel I walls and T walls. So if I were those. a geotechnical engineer and that was my project, I would want to go in and see how much of a load those piers could withstand. Right. And because once they give, the whole wall is going to come down, right? That's right. Right. Uh, I guess the, is, is the other way a levy gets destroyed with being overtopped? It, that's right. So a, a lot of the levees system, of 50 miles breached in the New Orleans and Katrina, and a vast majority of that was from overtopping. And so the water came over and scoured out the, the backside of that permeable levee mm. material, yeah. and then it failed. And, um, you know, Mother Nature is always going to win. And so yeah. we can only try to protect society. Uh, but when you live 20 feet below... The ocean, the the sea level, it's it's a it's a hard feat to pull off. So if they pulled you in to consult on the levee system in New Orleans, you would have some technical uh, suggestions for how they could strengthen it. But the other problem is just that sooner or later le levees are going to break, right? Sure, sure. They're always uh, they'll always be overtopped at some point. There'll always be that storm that overtops what you thought you were designing for ten years ago or twenty years ago, and so. We like to see the new building codes, and they've moved towards this as they're putting the houses up on stilts, um, raised foundations. Mm. So when it does overtop, because it will, the water can rush underneath and not destroy homes or kill anybody. Okay, so. let's maybe we could try to put you as a as an engineer and a researcher into that picture. Now you're you're within the broad category of civil. You're geotechnical. But now, would you be working on like a levy system? Is that something you would actually study or? Uh, well, I, I could do on a small scale, but my, my research interests are mainly unsaturated soils or expansive soils. And we live in Oklahoma and we have a lot of unsaturated dry soils that move when uh, rain or water mm. is introduced. And so I would be more comfortable practicing in the unsaturated expansive soil arena or foundations. So I might go to the Army Corps of Engineers to talk about the levee system, right. but if I'm going to build something in Oklahoma, a house or something else, I would come to you right. and you would be the one to figure out, do I have a good spot or does it need to be moved or piers put in the ground right. or, or something like that? Exactly. So uh, I like to do a lot of education with people when they're buying homes or they're building a home and 
you know, what kind of foundation do you need to put in this particular spot? And soils are so different, even within 50 feet of each other. And so if you're putting a home on one side of the street and I'm putting a home on the other side of the street, we could have different foundation elements just based on the different soils. And so we have a soil survey site that we can go to to look at what types of soils are underneath a particular house or a particular address. Did, didn't you tell me that every house in America is that its address is in there? That's right. And down to what, 72 inches? 72 inches, you can tell what the soil is and it's very accurate. In fact, the, uh, the USDA who puts that soil survey on, uh, they have it down to, in my house, I have a very high bedrock at, to four feet on one side of my house and then I have a fat red clay on the other side of my house. And I know that because when I was digging my storm shelter, I found that four foot deep shallow bedrock. And when I was fixing the septic system, I found that fat red clay and they had it to within a few feet. So it's very accurate. I've been afraid to go to that site. I'm not sure I want to know what's under my house. I think a lot of people are like that. Yeah, they, they buy a house and they have some problems and, and it's, it's the soil. So. The other thing I wanted to ask you about, I think you got a really important award in 2009. Could you talk about that? Sure. In 2009, I was awarded the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, and that was based on my National Science Foundation Career Award on uh, building foundations in expansive soils. And so the President's Science and Technology Group chose my project as one of 100 in the country that year to recognize. And I think, you know, I was the only civil engineer in the group and I was chosen because our infrastructure in the United States is deteriorating. And it, according to the American Society of Civil Engineers, it was given a rating of a D plus. Mm. So it's uh, in very poor shape. And I think the White House really wants to focus on, on improving that infrastructure. So I got to meet the president in January of 2010 and uh, it was a lot of That's fun. That's a pretty select group. Yeah. So are there not enough geotechnical engineers? Is that what you're kind of suggesting? Infrastructure's decaying, but we don't really have enough people to go out there and tell us what needs to be done? Well, I think all of my students that come out of geotechnical engineering with a master's or PhD have a job waiting for them nine months before they graduate. Wow. So because the population is expanding and we're moving into areas that we couldn't inhabit before, uh, or we're taking back land that we had used for something else before, like a landfill or a near shore area, and we need different kinds of foundations, um, or even in earthquake prone areas that people were scared to build in before. And so the, the field is actually, I, I feel like it's growing and there's always a job for anyone that comes, a good geotechnical engineering. So your work just uh, focuses right down on the ground under my house. What, what would we typically do? Let's say I'm building a house somewhere sure. in Norman or in the state and uh, I'm a little bit worried that the ground might move. Maybe there was something there before and, and there was some shrinkage and some expansion, et cetera. What would we do to look, if I came to you and said, help me understand the soil sure. uh, under my potential house? Well, the first thing we would do is go out to the site and we'd look around and see if there was any, you know, drainage uh, problems or what kind of vegetation was growing. And then we'd bring a drill rig out and we'd drill a few holes in your site where you thought you'd want your house. And we'd look at the soil and we'd say, uh, you know, you have a clay and the active zone is about eight to 12 feet down. So we're gonna to wanna to put a pier system that gets below that active zone. So when the soil swells and shrinks because of rainfall or drought, your house won't be affected. So generally clay is not a good thing, right? Because it, it, it tends to expand and contract so often, right? The expansive clays do. We love clays for landfill liners because we wanna keep in all of that, that leachate. So yeah. we love a, a fat clay, we love that, uh, uh, impermeability of the clay, but to build a house on, uh, not so much. So we, we really would prefer to build on a sandy gravel. So what can you do? Let, let, let's say that you've you've looked at my plot and it's just too much, I think you call it fatty clay, fat, fat, clay, fat clay, right? And it's it's just a, it's a bad deal. What are the options? I mean, you could put piers down. Sure. We could move somewhere else. Yeah. Can you treat the soil in some way? You can. Expansive soils, like I was talking about, the active zone, it's how far the so uh, water can infiltrate into that mm -hmm. ground. And in Oklahoma, it's around 12 feet. And so it'd be pretty expensive to excavate 12 feet down and then replace that with select fill. So we could try to stabilize that soil with chemical stabilizer, a lime, a cement kiln dust, or a fly ash. Mm -hmm. um, but typically, the least expensive uh, 
option would be to simply drill a pier down below that active zone and put an elevated slab and then put your house on on top or we could do a basement a basement below that uh, active zone and that would work as well. So a lot of your research is on just the 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 problem of expansive soil sure. and and either what to do about it, you know, piers, piles or or sometimes it is there is a chemical treatment, the, the kiln dust as you said and right. cement dust and so on. Right. Are those generally successful? treatments? Right. We usually use chemical stabilization in roadways. So if you're driving down the road, I-35, for example, has almost all of it is chemically stabilized. And so we want to make sure that it's a smooth drive for people going 70 miles an hour. So we do a lot of stabilization on roadway subbases, but not so much under residential pads or commercial pads. We typically solve those problems with different types of foundations. So a lot of the time, it seems to me what you're doing in your research is to, on a micro scale, look at some small sampling from a site and then try to understand that soil and then be able to project or predict what would happen on the macro scale once the site's actually being used and there's a load on it, correct? Correct. So what an engineer's job is, is to make it easier for society to live the way we want to live. And so I really like working on problems that are immediately applicable to the real world. And so what, we're, what I'm trying to do in the lab is figure out how that soil is going to behave under traffic loads, under uh, large building loads, under, say, um, a dam or a levee load, and make it easier for the contractor or for the design engineer to identify those problems and say, and give them some options to mitigate that type of soil and to even maybe avoid any problems in the future. So I'm looking at the very micro scale. How is each individual particle interacting with each other? And then we're doing some large scale tests to actually blow that up and say, okay, if I put a house that weighs this much on this soil and we add this much water, how much is that actually going to raise? Um, and so I think that's really important because now it makes it less expensive for the homeowner, less expensive for the contractor, less expensive for that design engineer because they're using our techniques that we're coming up with in the lab and they're applying it to the real world to come up with a better foundation. So it's a reliable thing to do, to, to research the chemical properties, the pH and so sure. on of the soil in a very small sample and then know with a lot of reliability how it's going to what kind of load it's going to bear, et cetera, once it's actually out there in the world. Sure. And, and, you know, you can't do a lab test just all by themselves. You have to actually go out into the field and, and test what, you've, what you think is going to happen. And that's what we do. So we, we, we get an idea of what we think is going to happen in the lab. And then we go out to the site and we measure the strength of a roadway, for example. We measure the heave of a house. Uh, and we get some physical data from the, the large scale to tweak kind of our models that we came up with in the lab. And it works very well to go back and forth like now, that. Now, the other area you work in a lot, I think, is is it helical uh, anchors? That's right, helical Could anchors. You, helical anchor. Could you describe what that is? Sure. Uh, well, I got involved with helical anchors in my graduate studies when my advisor was working to uh, come up with a different kind of foundation for cell towers. Mm -hmm. And when I moved to Oklahoma, I was approached by a, a student in my first foundations class, and he was a vice president for Berge Wind Power in Norman on the North Base. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, we're really looking for alternative foundations for our, our wind uh, towers. Can you, can you help us with that? And I said, well, I think I've got a great idea. Let's do helical anchors. And so I did a long-term study. Describe a helical anchor. What, what would it sure. look like if we had one in this room? A helical anchor is like an auger, and you spin it. It has different flights uh, different plates. Like a, a large wood screw? Large kind of? wood screw okay. with different size plates that you screw into the ground mm -hmm. uh, till you get the, the right um, bearing capacity, the right mm -hmm. torque. And the anchors, you want to be strong in uplift, mm -hmm. and, but we also use helical anchors for compression, so underneath buildings. And so I did a long-term studies. I pulled these anchors um, for three, four weeks under flooding conditions with the same type of loading that it would feel on a tower. So we instrumented a tower to find out what those wind loads were, and we pulled them, and we showed that they work really well. And why I like helical anchors is because you can put these helical anchors yeah. in anywhere that you have um, a soft enough soil to get into. Uh, you can put them anywhere you can't get concrete in a mountainous area, 
in uh, a small village in China, in a small village in Africa, where they need a wind power to pump water, and for example. And it's green, right? I mean, once you it's don't totally want to be there anymore, you just screw it back the other way, exactly. take it out, and uh, and off you go. Yeah, so it's, it's good for many different reasons. It's green. You don't leave anything. You don't leave a footprint behind when you leave. Uh, you can put these in with um, animal uh, power. So in a small village, you can you can hook horses up and you can spin these in and then put your small one kilowatt wind turbine on there to pump your water in the small villages. Um, they're, and they're, they can hold up large wind turbines too in those big fields that you see all across Oklahoma. So. Is the reason that you're focused on these anchors, that giant anchors that screw into the ground, because in the future we're gonna have a lot more uh, alternative energy sources, et cetera. So stabilizing some kind of a perpendicular vertical object on land really matters, and that's where the anchors come in? It, it does really matter. And, you know, we have solar arrays. We have the wind farms. We have lots of these different types of um, alternative energy that are in places where you can't get a concrete truck. Right. Okay, so you want to have solar power. You're going to probably be up in a mountainous area, away from trees, to get the most of your solar array or in the desert uh, and you can't get that big concrete truck or it's so far away from the concrete batch that it doesn't make sense to use concrete. So we can use these alternative foundations to be just as strong as the concrete. Now, every um, time I have put one of those big kind of uh, steel screws into the ground to hold up a tree and I've screwed it in, you know, they're yeah. about this big, yeah. they come out pretty quickly. Well, that's because you're not putting them in far enough. Okay, yeah. okay. So you have to get these anchors in uh, to at least three times the width of the largest screw. Um, and we typically, we won't put an anchor in uh, shallower than 10 feet. So that top, the top helix has to be 10 feet down, which means the bottom is probably around 13 or 14 feet. So if I came to you with a problem, I'm going to put a wind tower up or something, mm -hmm. and uh, we can't get concrete in there, would you... Uh, advise me based on, uh, you know, examination of the soil properties you're talking about earlier, what all of those same standards of judging the soil there to see how it's going to hold the anchor, they would all be applicable? That's right. We would go in with a drill truck and drill and see if you have the only way you, the only reason you couldn't put in a helical anchor is if you had shallow bedrock. So mm -hmm. if you have bedrock around 10 to 12 feet, there's no way you can get a helical anchor in. Um, because you need that overburden, you need that, that soil on top of the anchor mm -hmm. to hold it down. Um, but if you had bedrock that was down 30, 40 feet, we could put a, a helical anchor in. Um, you're also interested in uh, uh, going into the schools, in sure. junior high and high school and science education. Talk about that a little bit. Well, um, one of the problems I see from you know sitting in the college level is we don't have a lot of female engineers mm -hmm. that come through. And I know from my experience, I didn't know what an engineer did until maybe junior year in high school. I'd never even heard the word engineer. So I'm very passionate about going into the schools and telling every student, boy or girl, hey, do you know what an engineer does? And just give them the option to have that as a career. You know, everyone says, oh, I want to be a doctor. Or I want to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. and they don't even know what an engineer is. So, so what our goal is to go into seventh and eighth grade and talk about what an engineer does. We, we show them really cool, fun projects on earthquakes, and we make things break. D didn't you and do a big project we with did. Uh, earthquake? What was the material you used? Jello for this? We used Jello. So we had to come up with a way. All of the modules in the schools right now are collapsing of buildings, but that's really structural engineering. So mm -hmm. soils, geotechnical engineering is soils under the ground. You can't really see it. So we wanted to come up with a uh, a material that you could see. So we mm -hmm. thought of Jello, mm -hmm. And then we said, well, if we're gonna do Jello, let's make it all edible. So we came up with piles that are Slim Jims. Okay. And then we came up with that, the mass, that's a lollipop. The, so the building, the, the bridge is a lollipop. And then we wanted to stabilize that. You know, when you shake Jello, it's very wobbly. Okay. And so what we were showing the students is if you put a bridge in this really soft soil, it really shakes and you're gonna lose lives or, or damage the bridge. Um, and so we have to stabilize it. So in the, in the real world, we stabilize with cement. But in the classroom, we stabilize with peanut butter, mm -hmm. marshmallows, and cheese. And so the students had to figure out how big to make their stabilization zone to stop the movement of the lollipop. Basically a design problem. It's a design problem. And they loved it. And uh, we split up the, the, the 37 students. 
and there was five girls in the class. We, we put them in a group, and everybody else had their group, and they had a design competition with cost and performance who could come up with the best design, and the girls' team won. Why is it the girls' team won? Oh, great sure. outcome. Yeah. Why is it so hard to get girls into the stream of education that goes into sciences and engineering and uh, basically your area? Well, I think, like I said before, I think both boys and girls don't know about engineering, number one. Mm -hmm. And something happens around eighth or ninth grade, the girls and boys have equal interest in science and math, and then they get to high school and I don't know what happens. And so maybe they don't have a, that role model to keep them in the sciences and the engineering. Um, if we do get them into, into college, uh, we have a pretty good retention rate. So the people that start the engineering finish the engineering. So probably it's, it's just, just the them. fact of you're going into the public schools and girls seeing you, you know, the smart engineer and you're an, uh, an expert and an a, a authority on what you do. Sure. I mean, that must just speak volumes. That's very powerful, actually. I think it is really powerful. And, and we had, after we went into to Whittier Middle School, we had a, a little girl write us a note that said, you know, I, I never liked coming to school. I didn't like science, but you came and you showed me this engineering module. Now I want to be a geotechnical engineer. And so, you know, it just, it's really fantastic that you can, one person can have that much of an impact. But we need to do that on a larger scale. We right? do need to. And that's yeah. why we gave this module to the teachers in the Norman area. So we, we gave our module to 50 teachers and we said, okay, here's all the material. We'll, we'll pay for all of this. Now you go back into your classrooms and, and do this in the, in the classroom and tell everybody what a civil engineer is. And so hopefully we can get a broader reach that way. I think we've got just about a minute left. What would you say is going to be on the horizon in the next, say, 10, 20 years in the uh, geotechnical world? What, what should we look for? What, what are the big breakthroughs or developments going to be? Well, I think um, the big breakthroughs are going to be better foundations for earthquake-prone areas to keep those buildings upright to let the people get out. Um, of course, water is a huge issue. That's not a geotechnical specific problem, but we need to protect our water sources. and uh, Reclaiming land. Reclaiming maybe. land yeah. and just making um, it safe to live in different places that we haven't been able to live before. Dr. Amy Serrato, thank you so much for being here today. That's all we have time for today. Join us next time for more current conversations. Thank you for being with us. <laughs>